Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Patriots History. I am Larry Swigart, co-author of Patriots History of the United States with Michael Allen. We've been reading through Patriots History, and um, this is lesson nine. Um, I'm going to take a break from the reading, as I will do from time to time, to introduce some new research that's just come to my attention and, and really needs to be uh, developed just a little bit. It's not going to be a long lesson today, but it will it will help you. And you know we have this very long footnote called Did Columbus, or sidebar, I guess, called Col Did Columbus Kill All the Indians? And this is a new newer piece of research that belongs in that discussion. It is called Indigenous Continent, hope I'm saying the guy's name right, by Pekka Hamelainen. And um, the gist of this book is it's a revision. Um, it's, but it's not the revision in the way you think it might go. It's not the revision that says, oh, actually the Europeans weren't so bad after all, or actually the Europeans were pretty smart. Or anything. No, no, no. It's a revision that says we've been treating the Indians, and I call them Indians, not Native Americans, because I'm a Native American. I was born here. That's the definition of a Native American. So um, Hamelinen says that the Indians have for too long been portrayed as victims, that um, they were kind of helpless in the face of the white man. <clears throat> and his point is that, um, or his revision rather, is that actually the Indians were really, really smart. And they were always outsmarting and outmaneuvering the white men. And uh, whether it was fooling them, which he claims they did all the time, by leading them further into the interior in search of gold and silver. The Indians figured out early on the Spanish wanted gold and silver, and so they just drew them into the interior to where they could kill them. Or whether it was um, a highly sophisticated government system that the Indians had that relied on relationships and kinship relationships, which is obviously true, versus a top-down system, which he admits the Aztecs did have, which made it so easy for Cortez to conquer the Aztecs. And by the way, he he's through that section in just a couple of pages. Uh, he doesn't want to talk about that at all, because it kind of disproves a lot of what he's saying. But he goes on to argue that kind of in the same vein as Richard White, whom we cite a lot, who uh, had the book called The Middle Ground, White's argument was that the Indians saw whites as just another tribe, um, just another ally or opponent to be dealt with, to form alliances with, to kill, whatever. And so um, you see, especially in the northern colonies, Massachusetts and elsewhere, where a number of competing tribes, the Mohicans, the uh, Pequots, the Narragansetts, others, um, the Raritans, were, were all fighting against each other. And when it was comfortable and when it was convenient, they would employ the whites to fight with them. <clears throat> and he gives many cases of Indian white alliance armies going to fight other Indians. Um, he makes the point that the um, trading that went on, such as Peter Minuet and um, Manhattan, that it was not the value of the goods the way Western historians portray it, Oh, the Indians, uh, Minuet tricked the Indians into selling him all this land for a few trinkets. Well, number one, and he doesn't make this point as well as he should, those trinkets were things that the Indians did not have. They had metal, uh, metal for pans and cooking that wouldn't melt. Uh, they had steel for blades. Uh, they obviously had guns. Uh, they had a whole line of things that were superior to Indian goods. Now, uh, Hamelinen doesn't really want to use that language, but that was the case. Uh, so when Minuet trades a few trinkets, he's trading in the Indianized equivalent of a Lexus for 
a Honda key, a Honda uh, Kia Soul or a Honda Civic or something like that, right? It's it's not in their eyes, they're not getting swindled. In their eyes, they're getting the better of the deal. But more important, and this is a point he does make that I think we we could reemphasize better, and that is that the process of the trade and the exchange itself was important to the Indians. It was a form of gaining trust. To Europeans, exchange like that was just an exchange of uh, goods of value that is equal to each party. That is, if you buy my book and you pay me in money, which is a physical manifestation of time, talent, and energy, uh, you are giving up something valuable to you, your money, for something that you hope will be equally valuable to you, my book. I am receiving your money so that I can buy something else, I don't know, maybe a Wild World of History coffee mug, that will be equally valuable to myself. So to Europeans, these are win-win transactions. To Indians, it was less important that it was win-win and more important that it was trust-trust. That we show you trust by giving you these goods, you show us trust by giving us some of your goods. This is especially true in the early Indian encounters with the pilgrims, was that they were they thought they were engaging in building trust. The colonists didn't see it like that. The colonists treated it as a rational market exchange. We're giving you these goods that benefit you. You're giving us these goods that benefit us. Hey, there's nothing else involved, right? We see this today where you'll take your business somewhere else if there's a better deal. Nobody's going to buy gas at 460 a gallon if right down the street they can get it for 430 a gallon. Doesn't have anything to do with whether or not you trust either gas station only has to do with how much you're paying. But again, the Indians didn't see it that way, and that's Hamilton's point. He then goes on to argue that um, the Europeans consistently failed to understand Indian kinship relationships, this business of trust bearing, what alliances meant, and so on and so forth, and kept trying to make them subjects of a dominion, which is what their minds came from. In England, everybody was the king's subject. In France, everybody was the king's subject, and so on and so forth. So I think my biggest problem with him is that he's perfectly willing to get inside the mind of the Indians, which we absolutely need to do. But he was not really willing to get inside the mind of the Europeans and say, well, they thought this way, the Indians thought that way. It's not a question of who's right or wrong. The fact is, and this is a very brutal painful fact for history. When you have utterly competing worldviews, I'll just say this, the Nazis versus the democracies. These are two utterly competing worldviews. You can't allow one to sit and fester. Uh, kind of jumping ahead, Hitler believed he not only had to wipe out the Jews because they were a threat to Germany, but he had to wipe out the entire Jewish lineage including, in his warped mind, Stalin and Roosevelt, whom he saw as instruments of the Jews. He had to wipe them all out, or Germany could not survive. That's crazy. That's wrong, in our view, but that's how he saw it. So it helps to understand history, for example, when we are looking at the fact that <clears throat> in 19, late 44 and Late, 1940, late 1944 and early 1945, the trains on the East Front continued taking Jews to be killed when historians argue they could have been using those to send troops and forces to the front. Yes, but in Hitler's warped mind, destroying Jews was the first goal of the war, not winning the war. I know that's nuts to us. But if you don't understand your enemy or your opponent, or if you don't understand your trading partner, you're going to have trouble. And this goes both ways. He clearly didn't under, Hitler didn't understand the West at all. But we also didn't understand what his motivations were. If we had, we might have changed tactics a little bit. I don't know. 
But in the case of the indigenous continent that um, Harmalainen discusses, the English and Spanish settlers had no clue as to how the Indians really operated. And what this means is by the end, they just come down to might makes right. I, I don't get what you're saying. I don't hear what you're saying. We're gonna have to get rid of you guys because you keep intruding in our settlements. You keep killing people. And the Indians say, well, you killed people getting into our settlements on and on and on, right? But it comes down to, as we've said in Pinkert's history, property rights. That the Europeans believed in property land that could be sealed off, set aside, developed, and the Indians did not develop land. They had the view that the land was already developed. It was for hunting and gathering and nothing else. Okay, These are worldviews that are going to collide with fatal results. You can't get around it because treaties don't mean the same thing to each side. They say, well, white man broke the treaty. Well, Indians broke the treaty. No. Neither side had an understanding of what the treaties were, according to Hamelina. So finally, final point of his book, he, he keeps acting like the Indians defeating these small groups, and they were tiny groups of settlers, 30, 40, even 200, was some sort of big deal. Oh, look, they defeated these settlers. Oh, they wiped out this encampment. I'm not, he's not celebrating that, but he's kind of pointing to it like, See how advancing, oh, see how clever the Indians were, see how advanced they were. Folks, here's the story. At Tenochtitlan, you had 1,000 Spanish conquistadors, mostly footmen, march all the way across the country and defeat a nation of 1 million that had 100,000 soldiers. So they're outnumbered 100 to 1, and they defeated them. That's the story. So the question we need to ask is why? How is it possible that they could go in with being outnumbered 100 to 1 and win easily? Or with Pizarro in Peru, how is it possible a guy could go in with 80 soldiers and conquer the entire Inca nation? Hundreds of thousands of people, thousands and thousands of soldiers. How? So same thing in New England. How is it possible that these scant bands, 40, 50, 100 people, a couple hundred people there, probably no more than a few thousand total on all the East Coast, how was it that they, over time, not in every single battle, but over time, continually defeated and pushed back the enemy? And, and that's the historical question. That's the question of significance. The question of significance is not how did a Indian population, yes, of many different tribes, many different views. How did this massive Indian population not defeat a few thousand Europeans who not only hung on, but steadily expanded throughout the rest of the continent? That's the real question. And I think that's a question that Hamelinen either ignores, deliberately misses, or doesn't understand. I don't know which it is. Anyway, that's lesson number nine on the latest scholarship regarding Indians and Native Americans. I'll see you here back next time.